Good evening. Are you ready? I have to tell you a story. We'll get to all of this later. It doesn't matter. That was a joke. Did they tell the joke right? <laughs> Don't make me look bad up here. Okay. So um, I got here yesterday in the morning. And on the plane on the way here, I learned the entire language of Portuguese. But, so that you don't feel bad about how fast I learned that, I'll just use English, okay? <laughs> so I'm trying to be generous, you know, and very kind. And I actually am still struggling with English, so there's no point in me trying to learn anything else. We, we want to talk about this, right? The biomechanics of strength. Let's do that. What every person here has a different perception or mental image when we say the word strength. Somebody probably thinks about this because you saw it on TV or it's your background or it's your passion or I don't know what. Other people may be thinking about something totally, totally different. And that is part of the problem with exploring this. This person may be thinking of strength very differently. This person may be the strongest one that we've shown so far. You like that picture? I like that picture. This is my favorite version of strength right here. I like this little guy. Is this you? When you were a little kid? No? So, there's a couple things, two things at least, that we probably need to talk about. So when I was in the hotel and I did use Google Translator and I put in strength to see what came up in Portuguese. That was my only thing I actually learned about Portuguese. But it said force. And I went, oh no, that's not gonna work at all. Because strength has so much more involved in it than just force. Force is a very small piece of an important equation. <laughs> but can we agree for our purposes that these two things are not the exact same thing? Everybody's okay? Yeah? Arthur, you're good? Okay. <laughs> if I was told, I was told that um, the idea would be that strength would be, strength would be related to muscular force. Is this something that would make more sense besides just a normal dictionary definition. <clears throat> I still, we need, we need to go further than that. Strength is not force. Strength is not muscular force. Okay. Certainly, there is a lot of neurophysiology involved in strength. And we are not dismissing any of that. But that is not going to be our focus today, okay? So if we don't talk about it again, nobody should get their feelings hurt, it's just for another day. Tomorrow, lunchtime, we'll talk about that, okay? Something like that. Maybe happy hour, that would be good. But the thing we need to talk about is this. The mechanical side of strength, which almost, almost never gets discussed. And that's really, really, um, a tough thing to really understand strength without understanding even our measurement tool. How do we measure strength? The very first thing I put up there, it was, it was weight, a heavy weight. And we think that's the measurement, that's what we always use to measure how strong someone is, at least in the gym, at least in sports. So we're gonna have to look beyond that. Strength is, how many of you are familiar with this term? Torque. Anybody? Yes? like this? Okay. <laughs> this is really important because if we were going to say that strength is one word, which is still not enough words, we'd have to say strength is torque. Okay? So we have to talk about what torque is, just for a review for you, and maybe other people haven't heard it before. Okay? There are two pieces of the recipe 
the equation for torque. And this one, we already talked about as being not the same as strength, it is just one piece of torque. It is 50% of the equation. Meaning that if we get too focused on that one piece, we'll be wrong. Because the rest of it is of greater import, of equal importance and it's, it's almost more important to talk about because people dismiss this thing called moment arm. Even if we learn it in school, it immediately gets put in a drawer, hidden away, and never comes out again. So we're gonna spend some time with that right now. This, believe it or not, is two bones. Do you believe it? You guys, are, are you okay? okay? Don't be sad, it's not, this is not a sad story, I promise. It'll be okay. Right. So, force times a moment arm is what torque is. What does that have to do with anything? Well, it starts, in my world, it starts down here. There's no reason to even begin to talk about strength without understanding the tool that we're using to challenge strength, whether it's assessing it or trying to improve it. And so at some point in time, we'll have to spend a little bit of time, maybe a lot of time talking about the idea of resistance. And what this dumbbell is representing is going to be the torque of resistance. So there's a line of gravity pulling down and we have to extend that line upward a little bit so that we can find this moment arm thing. So moment arm is a distance that we could measure, centimeters, miles, it would be a big one if it was miles. It is perpendicular to the line of force and goes to the what? Axis. Why does that matter? Everybody's heard the word torque somewhere in their lives. If anybody who's gone to school for this stuff has heard the term moment arm, and it just, it, it doesn't ever seem to do anything for us. We've got to understand that not only does this resistance have a moment arm that's changing as we move the weight, but the muscles that are pulling against that resistance also have a set of moment arms that will be changing as we move also. Why does that matter? Has anybody ever had a flat tire? No? Yes? Nobody? And you have a big, you have a wrench you put on there to try to loosen, right? To try to loosen the, the nuts. And if you had a little wrench this long, it would be very, very difficult to loosen, right? We want something really long so we can, what do, what do we call it? We call it leverage. I think leverage is not the right word, so I'm gonna make up a word, it's called moment armage. And she'll never know how to translate that. I'm gonna make up more words just to make your life more difficult than it already is. So, what happens when we move? Well, the muscle did what between here and here? It got shorter, and more importantly for us right now, the moment arm got much longer. Do you see the moment arm right here compared to here? So as we move, the muscle changed its relationships to the bones and the muscle's ability changed, the torque changed. This is a huge feature in strength. We're gonna call it the mechanical side of muscular torque, okay? And of course, the dumbbell's doing its little thing right there. And by the time we get to the top, what do you think happened to the muscle? Shorter again. Moment arm has changed yet again. So you can see between these three different positions, the ability of this muscle has changed in two different ways in each position. One occurs when the muscle itself gets shorter or longer. We'll have to talk about that, but right now the thing I would like for you to see is the moment arm change. How do you feel about that? Can you see? Everybody's good? So the muscle has a longer crowbar or lever, or it has a shorter one based upon that situation, right? Very important. <clears throat> we have to throw in, how many of you have heard of length tension? Yeah? It's something that 
a lot of us learn, and quite frankly, most of the textbooks, the information is incomplete. It is not applicable. And the reason is because all the research on length tension was done by taking a muscle fiber out of the body, putting it over here in the laboratory, hooking it up to something, and watching what happens when a muscle is lengthened all the way, where? In here? No, outside of the body, or is shortened outside of the body. They electrocute it. That, only in a very small way, represents what's truly happening when that muscle is attached to your bones. So number one, this idea of length tension. Length tension is not strength. It is, bless you. It is, did you tell her that I said that? Okay. <laughs> length tension is that changing force portion of the torque equation. The moment arms were changing, and the length tension of the muscle was changing in each example at the same time. <clears throat> so we need to go back and take a look at this nonsense that has a little bit of truth to it. You've studied before and seen this. Come on, little guy. Okay. How about, uh-oh, something froze. Ah, did it finish? Okay. That was a very short... Oh, then we kept going. <clears throat> so you've seen this before if you've studied length tension. It's simply the muscle is in a longer position or a shorter position. But this graph that you've seen before is not the muscle. It is what? What did I say? It's a fiber removed from his arm, his left arm. It was big enough that they said, okay, we can take out part of his arm and he'll be okay. These are funny jokes. Are you saying the funny jokes? <laughs> So remember, it was outside of the body. So we can never experience that much lengthening of tissue inside of us. There are other things in the way that prevent, prevent that from happening, right? But just to recall, when it's short, they show you a graph. Whoa! They show you a graph that says we're losing what? We're losing what? Tension? Force? What happens when we get over here? We do this again? No. <laughs> when you get over here, so at the extremes you have what it looks like, no ability to generate tension in a muscle. That's what the graph says. And it's true in a laboratory with a muscle fiber removed from the body. They tell us other things. In different books, they'll have different shapes of curves. Sometimes People want to argue with me over, oh, that's not the right shape, it's this shape. Every book you pick up will cite somebody else's research that presents a different shape of the curve. The general idea is the same. Within this thing, there is a, a place that they call optimal length. And it simply means that it's as much tension as the thing's ever gonna create, but it's not a place. This book shows it as a range. This book showed it as one position. It's not worth arguing over because the point is the same. We have to figure out how to make this applicable. I have read books that say length tension is the place where you can create maximal tension. That's not, that's not what this says. Length tension is about a relationship. It's not about a place, right? So there's another part of this. Normally. We see this little curve, the white curve, and we go, that's it, that's all. But there's this other thing. If I say passive tension, what, what do you think we're talking about when I say passive tension? Because we're talking about a muscle, right? And a muscle makes, come on, active tension. Did you see that? So your brain says go and your muscle like a motor turns on an engine or something. So it's, it's burning fuel, it's making this happen. But then on top of that, we have this thing called passive. What does that mean? Picture in your mind, this muscle is more than just the part inside that makes the tension of contraction. You with me? 
This thing is built with tissue, right? It's like the difference between a car engine and the pistons that are turning the things and the, the explosions that are happening inside of there versus the actual engine block itself, the piece of metal. Does that make sense? So the passive influence in this length tension thing is the actual tissue, not the contraction, but the tissue that makes up the muscle. And its greatest influence starts occurring as you get a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer. Because when the muscle is shortened all the way, that's not being stretched. Does that make sense? So they throw in this little piece of the puzzle in the laboratory with the muscle fiber taken out of his arm and put over there so we can electrify it. Ultimately, if I asked you to draw the length tension curve, it would be the red line. Not just the white one, not just the yellow one, it's the combination of the two. And that still has nothing to do directly with what happens inside of you. I keep saying that, why do I keep saying that? I don't want you to forget. It was not a trick question. I will tell you when I have a trick question, okay? I'll let you know. It will not be very tricky. So, there are a lot of reasons that we could sit and look at this and say this, we know lots of reasons why this is not what happens in real life. And it, there's, there's many issues here, but when they actually attempt to study tension changes in muscle, that's in the body, they can't do it because it's in the body. So what you're really measuring is a version of torque. Strength here, strength here, strength here. But we're not just measuring tension, are we? We're measuring torque. So 50% of it is the tension and 50% of it is the moment arm. So the whole idea of length tension can't be explored in the human body. So what we're really doing is looking at torque production, and this is where our story really, really begins. There are some books now that are actually looking, they don't know how to change the words. They still say they're looking at length tension, but they're measuring it by how much the subject can push or pull on, on something, which means there's a moment arm in effect. And they actually go in and say, moment arm has something to do with this. It's like, you think? That was sarcasm. Are they doing sarcasm? Okay, over there. Are there? No. So the bottom line is with this picture is that they showed us that that normal curve that went way down on each side, we're really in real life in these two joint muscles, we're just living around the top, around that optimal length area we talked about before. Now, why do you think that would actually be brilliant for us to never get into a place where we lost all of our tension because it was too short or all of our tension because it was too long, how would, we, how would we move? You'd be running from the tiger that lives in your neighborhood and you'd get to too short and you'd be like, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I, can't, I can't produce tension. Time, time out. Wait, oh, now I can. It's really important for humans and everything else to never get to a point where zero tension is a reality. Does that make sense? So, the more we think about it, there's a lot of things like that in this scientific world. Things that are true, they're just not true in you. It's a small piece of, uh, we're getting a small, small fraction of the picture through a textbook. What really happens is you've got things like bones in the way. So if we're looking at his arm again, not Armageddon, arm again. Those are, one's a movie and one is not. He has single joint muscles and two joint muscles, right? So we have biceps, a couple of them. And then what's underneath? Single joint muscle, brachialis, right? They are influenced very differently in terms of the available shortness and length that they can achieve. The single joint muscles, the joint stops moving before it ever gets extremely long or extremely short. Does that make sense? The two joint muscles are a little more interesting. 
we're again around the top of the graph, the part that was optimal length. But how can I change when my arm is all the way straight? How can I change the length of my brachialis? I can't. Could I make my biceps longer though than they are right now? How? This. And from here, my brachialis can never get shorter than this. Can my biceps get shorter than this? Possibly. What changed? The other joint that the muscle is participating in, right? So there are some decisions here based upon, oh, let me show you that one slide again. We're gonna say this word, this, you're gonna hear this. Secondary joint position. The other joint crossed by the two joint muscles and its influence on length tension will be different from then single joint muscles. So there, why are we bringing this up? These are actually gonna end up being exercise variations that we have some versions of historically, but we never really took full advantage of and never really understood, paid attention to what they do to strength. So, instead of this thing that goes all the way down here and all the way down here, we're going to have differences in tension between two joint and single joint muscles based primarily on secondary joint position, the other joint from what we're testing. So if we were to look at <clears throat> the passive tension part, the inside of the muscle part, the structure part, pretty much only two joint muscles are even gonna get long enough to participate in that. So any influence of passive tension is going to be relatively small and only in very specific joint positions affecting two joint muscles. So keep that in mind. Everybody doing okay? Do you need to stand up and breathe? No? Water? Rum? No? Okay. So that's the inside. That's the torque stuff. That's, if we don't understand that pretty well, we're not going to understand what we're looking at when we watch somebody do a bench press or try to get out of a chair when they're 100 years old. We're not going to know what we're looking at. Now, here's where it gets weird. The exhibition of strength. What do we use? What specific assessments, what are we looking at? What do we choose to go, wow, that person's really strong. This picture came up before, it's a deadlift, right? Is that the best method for assessing strength? What do we use there? We use weight. If you can lift 400 kilos, someone who can lift 401 is obviously stronger and that's all that matters is the number, right? But this exercise is for building what? Core strength, right? Supposedly. So how do we test? How do we exhibit improved core strength if we were to get any from this exercise? Where are the numbers? Will we start putting weight on someone? Get the deadlift bar and just set it on their back and go, oh, that was a little too much. Let's take some off. You know? See, we don't do that. How do we measure this? Typically the time. So and now we've stumbled into the endurance world all of a sudden to measure strength. Oh, you're really strong. You can hold that for 10 minutes. It's like, that, that's like a marathon in that world right there. So now, are, is it really about weight? Well, ultimately, yes. We measure, well, you, strength is force here? Not time, right? So we have these rules, we have these ideas, we, we have these things we say, but what we do all day long has nothing to do with what we say. And I, you don't have to be, you know, I think my cat figured this out before I did, okay? This is the only way to measure strength. You have to do this competition. So really strength becomes like a circus act. Don't get me wrong, these guys are very strong. Is this practical way of, oh, thought we had a question. Oh. How about this? I like this guy carrying refrigerators 
as the best version of strength. What do you think? Let's talk about this. There's a lot of this these days, pushing sleds around. Does this mean you're strong if you can push more weight? I don't know either. It seems like if you can put more weight on something and you can do it and then you can add, get stronger and do more, it seems like that should be, it seems like it's strength, but is it? Could you put so much weight on there that your feet start sliding on the grass, on the, on the carpet? So is it really that you're not strong enough or you don't have anything to push against that's stronger than the, like a wall? You see what I mean? We don't even get to see how strong you are in this example. That's going to be an important piece of this puzzle of what really, really, really are we testing and what do we want to know and what do we want to get better at? I've wanted to, this next thing, I've wanted to do this for a long time. I didn't want to hurt this guy's feelings and I don't even know who he is. But I know this person. Come on. Oh man, is it not going to work? I'm so depressed. All right, we're not leaving until this works. So get some food. You may have to change it in the computer over there. It's set to go auto, automatically. Technology. You're on the spot, man. It's all you. Really? He doesn't have a working version of PowerPoint in there. It's a read-only file. None of the videos are going to work. just going to happen okay so you take a break alô huh take então, a break tem bastante vídeo a versão do powerpoint do computador que tá passando não aceita o vídeo então aguardem ou aguardem cinco minutinhos para eles trocarem o computador rapidinho ou levantem vão no banheiro e voltem daqui cinco minutos mas é, como tem muitos vídeos é melhor a gente trocar o computador agora do que passar o resto da palestra assim né então aguardem um minutinho Não contávamos com esta parte. In the audio too. The nature of technology. Yeah. Transferring things from one thing to the next. But there's other videos, like videos of Al and stuff. It's going to work. For that? Yeah, as soon as we are recording the audio, we can find it. Right, right, she told me. But as soon as I get halfway, maybe the camera goes through. Let's do it now. Because the reception's not good enough, you think? Is that the thing? There's some type of something in here. There's an awful lot of things trying to happen in here at one time, too. Every headset, every everything. What do you want? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that stuff. Ooh, this is a cold one. Uh, do you want to? Do you, do you sure. like that? What? That is mine to this girl because she's been following us since the beginning. I already gave her a hard time like I do all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Watching the classes. <laughs> <laughs> Two pictures. Nice to meet you. Even close, it doesn't. Even close, there's too many things. You're right. Is it translation? 
It's all headphones. The translation is fine. No, it's all yeah. headphones. There's too many signals running around in here. Yeah, that's what it is. They don't have to be on the same. The only, the only thing that the different channels do is keep them from not mixing together. That doesn't mean there's not interference from each other. It's too much. You're right. That's the case. Hello. <clears throat> They're getting, they're understanding, and the translation is good, it's not bad. Hmm? It's not bad translations. Yeah? Stuck, stuck with the song. A gente fica escutando, a gente é difícil escutar o que ele fala, porque a tradução está muito alta. Está muito alta. Tem muita tradução junta e aí faz com que fique alto. O volume está baixo, mas como tem muito ao mesmo tempo, vai parecer alto. E deu interferência no microfone da câmera, não pega. Então não vai ter jeito. Eu tenho muito que ideia de não mostrar isso, porque eu não quero pegar a tradução e estou escutando. Foi? Ok, pessoal. Voltamos. Voltamos, voltamos, voltamos. Eu vou dividir. Hold on. So, quem está assistindo? Quem está assistindo o curso de análise mecânica das máquinas de musculação online? Tem alguém aqui que está assistindo esse curso online nosso? Levanta a mão aí. Essa menina que vocês vão ver aí é a menina que está em todas as. Ou tu eu ou tá ela. Então, quando vocês virem ali de ponta cabeça fazendo o que ela vai fazer, vocês não vão acreditar. A Amanda fazendo isso. É, ela é muito forte. Não, ela é powerlifter. Não é crossfiteira, ela é powerlifter. I told them it's Amanda, because they've seen her in the course. Can we go over there and change it so I can just click it? Like, like, there, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I got it. Foi? Here she goes, here she goes, here she goes. Okay, olha lá. So tell me which one's stronger. The guy we saw two hours ago on the first slide or her? This is the problem with saying, wow, she's really strong. Compared to who? Compared to what? I agree, she is. But I'm not sure we can compare everybody in a thousand different ways. So... This is obviously not in Portuguese. Scenario specific strength. It's really important for us to start to distinguish all the factors in one scenario or one example from any other scenario and not pretend that one is better than the other. Does that make sense? We have to start separating. And that's the people will argue over, no, no, no. That's way better exhibition of strength. And someone would say, yeah, but this guy's lifting a thousand pounds. Yes, but that's harder. Mm -hmm. But is that how we measure? Can we measure those two things the same way? So here's an example. Number one, don't do this. Number two, if this guy could do 135 on the ball one time if okay and then the same guy huh the same guy can do 315 
when he's on the floor. Which one makes him look the strongest? Two different scenarios, completely unrelated. You follow me? Traditionally speaking, the one with the most weight would be the one showing how strong he is. But we changed the entire environment, so those rules are gone. So here's a question for you, something that's gonna come up a little bit later. How much do you think skill would influence his ability to do more weight here? Not just muscular strength, but skill. He has to stay on the ball. This is gonna be an important question. Is lifting a weight or a lot of weight just about being strong? Or is there a skill level with everything? And you can show an increase in ability without your muscles changing at all, just because this changed and the coordination of all of this changed. So strength being directly related to muscle is a tough thing. We've got to look at the scenario. So let's bring in another guy, this guy. Right here, go. Ah, I like that guy. Let's pretend he's doing a million pounds. I don't know what he's doing, I, but it looks, that number fit on there, so I thought that's how much he's doing, okay? <laughs> now, you and I know that his strength comes entirely from wearing this. <laughs> if he was not wearing that, he would have no strength, okay? Kind of like Samson from the Bible, only in Scotland, okay? Now, here's the thing. If I compare this guy standing on the ground to this guy standing on the ground, which one might be stronger? We might say the guy that's lifting a million pounds, right? I'm curious. He's almost a million pounds stronger in this scenario, right? You can't mix the stories. It's like saying, okay, you're a boxer and you're really good at swords, so go. <laughs> but this guy can't stand on the ball at all. So we can't compare something someone can't do, and then claim that the other one is a better exhibition of strength. We have to be much more objective about this. We can't just use our favorites unless we're going to be consistent. We can't compare things that are not comparable. So, what else? This is my favorite part. I just wanted you to know. The appearance of strength, and you're saying, what's the difference between an exhibition of strength and the appearance of strength? I'm glad you asked. Some people would look at him because he's got the thing on again. And you go, I know that he's gonna be really strong and plus he's got sunglasses. So that's awesome. This guy may be ridiculously strong and I don't know how to compare the two. This guy may not be able to hang on to this bull at all. I like this guy the best. It's actually a friend of mine. It's a great story because he's a little tiny guy, this big. And he was just mostly a runner. He looks like a runner, right? He's run, he could run forever. And he just decided one day that he, he had always really loved that kind of strongman idea from the, from the carnivals and that kind of thing from a long time ago, right? It's like a circus strongman type of deal. And he literally, there are places to train to do this. Who knew? So he started learning this. And the guys he was learning from were just like had been, you know, they were 100 years old, these guys, and they knew all these tricks and had done all this stuff and they were amazing. And he actually got pretty good at some of those stuff. And he actually, when he learned the skill of it, and he's got his own version of strength per body weight type of thing, and grip and all this stuff. He actually does shows now. 
of this stuff. So he took this passion, and I'm sure everybody told him all along the way, you'll never do that, you're an idiot. I'm sure. Did she make that same voice I just made? No? no. But I think that's great that he did that. That's just against all odds, against probably what everybody told him, and that's awesome. Anyway, this is about things that make us look stronger but doesn't mean we are. There were tricks to what he did. He had strength, lots of strength, amazing amount of strength. He could crush your hand, and he could tear phone books, and he could do all these things. But there was also a deception to all of it. There was a skill he had to learn to make that trick work. You follow me? Numbers. In our world, if we don't understand mechanics, isn't that what we started talking about? The biomechanics of strength? If we don't understand mechanics, if we don't understand physics, we're not going to know when we've been deceived by the number that's on the weight. So here's an example. Five pounds, ten pounds. Which one would you have to lift? This is a trick question. Which one would you have to lift to look stronger? If it's a trick question, you shouldn't just answer it because something's going to happen, right? Just letting you know how to pass my test. They're the same, depending upon what. I already said strength is, strength is torque. So five pounds and 10 pounds at proportionate distances from the axis will make the same torque. Now there are other issues like joint forces and things that we don't even want to bring up because the context here, the topic here, is which one of those would be heavier. They are the exact same. The number is deceiving. If you're looking at only the number on the weight, the force part, and not the torque part. Does that make sense? So we do that all the time in this industry. Here's another fun one. You've seen this kind of machine over here. And listen, for what we're going to do right now, it doesn't matter whether you like one of these or hate one of these machines. There's a lesson to be learned that's bigger than the machine. Everybody okay with that? So this person is going almost straight up with 200 pounds. This person is lifting 280. Obviously, that person is lifting more weight than this person, correct? It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. Because something going vertically against gravity, you're getting 100% of the force of gravity, right? Something moving at that angle, you'd be getting 87% of that. Something moving at that angle, you're getting 71% of whatever weight is on there. So 1,000 pounds would be 1,000, 870, 710, and 500 pounds. It would say 1,000 pounds of weight on there, and you'd be lifting half of it. It's not magic. It's mechanics. Why does it matter? It only matters if we actually want to be the experts that we pretend we are about strength. And so... I don't think it matters if you don't want to know. It doesn't change your world. It's not, you know, it doesn't get you a better piece of steak tonight at dinner, you know. So unless you had a bet with her about something, and I don't know. But to me, this is incredibly important because everybody in the exercise world is talking about physiology and sports and all this stuff, and we absolutely have no idea what we're really looking at inside of all these things. We look at this piece of metal that's welded to another piece of metal and we say it's good or it's bad, it's functional or it's non-functional, and we don't have a clue. We are so willing to judge people and things and we don't have a clue. And it pisses me off. Just kidding. Everybody okay? Everybody's going. Seriously, it's kind of not really professional for us to have tools and not know anything about what they really offer someone because not everybody has the same goal you do. And if in your goal, one of those tools is not helpful and you impose your goal on every person that walks in front of you, that's a mistake. 
Just because you happen to have a hammer doesn't make everything a nail. You know? How about this? I like this picture. The brakes work fine, but nobody told the big rock inside. So let's talk about inertia for a second. Have you heard this, this term before? Inertia? This is a video, watch carefully. Watch this little needle right here. You don't need to see any numbers or anything. What you need to know is I'm holding five pounds. And if it stayed five pounds, that number, that, that red arrow should just be pointing the same direction. Every time I move it, watch your, go up and down with your eyes. Can you see the needle moving? That means it's not five pounds anymore. And if I really do it, it goes up to zero. Can you see it? That, uh, can, uh, here, hang on, hang on, I can go back and do it again. So now you know what you're looking for. Watch the needle. And in the beginning, it'll just do this. And then when I really start doing it, it'll go all the way up to five pounds becomes zero. So if you watch, if you get your eyes kind of sequenced, you can kind of tell what's the point. Well, why, if you hand someone a dumbbell, a client, and you hand them 10 pounds, five kilos, whatever. Did you hand them a random number? Did you look at the whole dumbbell rack and say, that one? Or did you choose one that you think might be appropriate for them? Because if you chose one that was appropriate, it's going to entirely change based on how they execute it. So do you really want that five pounds? Because the second you shift gears outside of the mechanics world and say, you have to move fast to be fast, which by the way is not exactly true. You also changed when you moved fast, you changed the resistance. That does not mean that it's bad. That means we need to know in order to make better decisions because it's not us that's having to deal with it. It's the client that we're responsible for. Do you see why this is important to me? Do you see why it's important to you? Because it is. This guy, I love the guy. The best part of this guy is the chain right here. So, we already know. Now, have you, have you really looked at this? Did you see the dumbbells up here? Did you see there's a chain and a barbell down under here? Don't ask me what he's doing. I have no idea. I do know that between his legs and his stomach, there will be no movement of this weight regardless. So don't worry about it. And I think the bigger concern is, quite frankly, with all this weight, this little tiny piece of metal is the only thing, right? It's like a kid's toy or something, right? <laughs> like a, yeah, exactly. Anyway, it doesn't, we could sit and calculate that amount of weight. And we could take, if we were interested in trigonometry, we could take the sine of a 45 degree angle and we could figure out that it would be 70% of whatever that weight is, roughly. But it's not 70% of the inertial effects. So if he is flying, if he's moving really fast through this range, he still has to start and stop that much, even if the actual weight is only a fraction of that. So an example to you is if you ever had to push a car that maybe the car died, you're not lifting it. Lifting it would be difficult. But sometimes we try to push it. What is it that makes pushing the car difficult to start? Inertia. The car gets moving. Here it goes. It's also going to be difficult to stop. So if you put your leg here and let the bumper, you're going to stop it with your knee Bad idea, because you will have the entire inertia of the car, not weight, the inertial effects against your you know, ACL and things like that. So the inertia 
of something is independent of its weight. And we have to understand their independence and also when they come together. This is part of our job, in my mind. Maybe not. I think it is. All right, it's a test. Are you ready for the test? Of course you are. Yes? You sure? Are you? All right. This angle, do you have your calculator? Get out your phone. I don't have my phone. Get your calculator. Okay. This is eight degree angle. This is how much weight? Well, given that the weight's just going straight up and down, it doesn't matter what this angle is. It was a trick. The angle was about the direction the weight is moving. If this weight stack is moving straight up and down, it doesn't matter what direction you're moving. So you can't just look at a machine and its angle and say, oh, I learned about this. What is it that was actually moving at the angle? It was the weight that we put on there plate by plate. Does that make sense? So now if somebody lays on there, their body weight will have a percentage. But it's important that there's much more to this than the introduction that we're basically getting here. Figuring out how to make it all actually work in the gym is an important piece of the challenge. So, do you need a break? Are you okay? You okay? Yeah. We're going to, this is part of the idea of the appearance of strength. Just like the numbers we went through. But it's related back to that torque idea. Do you remember the torque? Force times the moment arm. So, we're going to be looking at points where someone might be really having to use a lot of muscle to demonstrate strength or to be strong. And other points in the range where they may appear to be even stronger and it requires virtually no muscle. So, let's look at these guys. Let's call this the bottom of the squat, and let's call that the top of a squat. I'm sure you already recognize that. This person, right here, we could put much, much more weight on this person here than we could here. This person could probably hold, if they could hold 200 pounds here in this position, they could probably hold over 1,000 in the other position. Why? Moment arm of resistance, right? This weight is almost balanced over the joints. Does that make sense? It has almost no moment arm, almost has no moment arm here, almost no moment arm here, and over here it has big set of moment arms to each joint. What does that mean? The 200 pounds over here is producing more torque than the 1,000 pounds would over there. 1,000 pounds times zero is what? Zero. It would feel heavy. It would feel like it's crushing you. But if you're really stacked with one joint on top of the other, it's just going to feel heavy. It's not trying to bend you until there's a moment arm. Does that make sense? So the title of this was muscular strength versus structural strength. When they're building, when they're constructing this building, they line up things in specific positions so they don't crush. Right? This is as close as we're going to get to be uncrushable. This requires muscle fighting that torque of resistance the whole time. This requires 100% muscular strength, and this is largely due to structural strength. Does that make sense? So throughout a range of motion, your ability will change for numerous reasons, depending upon the activity. And we're going to look, our very last thing for today is going to be looking at this thing called strength profiles. So where is a human weaker and where are they stronger? And how might we build an exercise to be consistent with that or close to that? So it's going to be important to know why this person's insanely strong here and why this is not only going to be weaker, fatigue is going to become a factor somewhere in there also and change all of this. So you know what you're looking at here? This is someone's head. 
and they're laying on the floor or a bench or something. Are you with me? There's one arm. It's a one-armed stick man. Got it? So what's the difference between this arm and this one right now? So one is straight. And the line of force, the line of gravity is doing what? It's almost balanced through the elbow and appears to be balanced through the shoulder. So there's virtually no torque of resistance. There may be a... 80 pound dumbbell in his hand. But at this point, it's not trying to bend his arm this way and it's not trying to bend it. Does that make sense? Over here, whoops. Oops, oops. This one is going to be very different because he has a moment arm to the shoulder and a moment arm to the elbow. He will not be able to use as much weight if, he were, if we were testing his ability in this position or this position. There'll be very different tolerances or abilities in those two positions. This is part of what's going to define that profile as I mentioned. We could call this, if you put together what we just looked at, we could call this a strength resistance relationship. The torque of the resistance at any point in the range is going to alter the appearance of strength. Wow, you look really strong up here at the top of a squat. Yeah, but it's not so much me. It's that the resistance is balanced through me. Does that make sense? So that's why we've got to say where you look strong and where you look weak has a lot to do with the resistance application itself. That's huge because what looks like a press is going to be, be totally different. You have a, have a cable going that way or a weight going this way. They're entirely different things. And one more reminder. One more reminder. Besides the fact, besides the fact that this and this are the same on those people, that number is not the resistance because that number is just the force. Force times what makes torque? The actual resistance would have to be 280 times those moment arms and 200 times those moment arms. The 200 is not the resistance. It's 50% of the equation. When we are attempting to demonstrate strength, some scenario specific version that we've decided on a ball or on the floor or whatever, there are several factors, maybe seven or eight, I can't remember, that, um, that will influence the outcome of this thing, that will influence how strong you appear to be or how strong the individual appears to be. And one of the things that will obviously affect this is how many joints are used to move the weight. And really, of course, it's about how many joints muscles do you use to move the weight, right? So if I, if you said to me, let's see how strong you are in a curl, okay? You would have to create a very, very specific scenario because, and I know you've seen this, it is very rare that someone would just do this, right? At best, we'd probably get this. But if someone was really trying to show off and do a lot of weight, it would look like, right? They would use every single thing from the big toe to the thumb, to the eyeballs, everything to try to lift the weight. So which one's better? The one that you can lift the most weight or the one that actually accomplishes the rules you decided on before you started. That's what we have to do. That's that scenario that we're in charge of. And so we can expect that a human brain will always want to find the easiest way. Motor learning, the orchestration of using muscles, that's what its job is to do, is to get you out of work by using every single thing possible. 
The problem is that may not satisfy the goal of the exercise or of what we're trying to find out in terms of strength. Does that make sense? So we have to make those decisions. And here's where some of the skill comes in. If you decide that we want to see how strong they are here, or we want to do an exercise just for this strength specifically, then their skill requirements are going to be to not listen to their brain that wants them, wants to, wants them to cheat. That becomes the biggest, most difficult thing to teach is how to actually get them to do it in the strict fashion that you may have decided is what you want. Does that make sense? And that is very, very difficult for some people to learn. And if there are any orthopedic or neurological compromises, and I don't just mean injuries, but something like someone has diabetes and they cannot feel the bottom of their feet. Somebody has had a stroke. Somebody has had a nerve injury. So they don't feel this. All these things are going to come into the picture and they're going, their brain is going to try to get, if you're trying to see if just this part of their foot, dorsiflexion, if you're trying to see, you know, it's weak and you're trying to see, well, gosh, well, how much is there? Their brain is not interested in showing you how weak that is. Their brain is interested in showing you everything else. Does that make sense? The world has come to call that compensation. And we have kind of been taught that compensation is bad. I think it's a mistake and somewhat childish of humans to feel the need to label everything as good or bad because we're doing it from a perspective where we don't know why it's there in the first place. We're judging things for the wrong reasons. That idea that your body will find a way to get around the tough stuff is brilliant. That's why we're all still here. The thing we have to go back and do is say, does it satisfy our goal? I cannot see what we need to work on in this person's foot or ankle if they're showing me everything they're good at because that's what their brain's trying to do. So that's why these parameters and our responsibility becomes very important, important in creating not just an assessment that you're trying to identify strength or weakness, but as you start trying to improve that strength, this thing can't get sloppy because they'll be doing everything else but what you're trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? The portion of the range of motion that you use will determine how strong you appear to be. Here's what I mean. If you ever, you ever watched powerlifting? You ever seen a powerlifter? Someone built for powerlifting? Their structure is perfect for powerlifting. They have a very thick rib cage. You follow me? And that does a lot of interesting mechanical things inside in terms of how the muscles will work and makes them very strong at bench pressing. But also the bar coming down to touch their chest, their, their full range of motion is only at the strongest end of this range. You with me? So to play by the rules of full range, they're doing almost no moving but they're built correctly for the sport, right? Now, if I bring someone else like me up there to be a powerlifter and I go, they, they get to stop here. Do I get to stop here? No. Do I get to stop here? No. I have to go back here. Why? Because you hate me. And I feel bad. I'm just not built for it. The range that I had to go through and the changes inside of me that occurred and how far I... You remember the, lo the load being balanced through the limb we talked about? The strength resistance relationship? I got so far away from my structural strength that the resistance was actually getting heavier. The moment armor resistance was getting heavier, every inch I moved further than what he did. I would have lifted twice as much as that person because the torque of resistance was more where I ended up than where he ended up. So now let's talk about who's strong, okay? It wasn't me either way. It was the other guy. What are you doing over there? Oh, hi. Have you met all my friends? Okay. 
So you see what I mean by the number of joints? That's a choice. Your brain wants to use them all, but you can decide based on what you're actually trying to accomplish. How far you're actually moving through the range is a choice. I know that we're told, move full range of motion, but nobody that says that term, nobody that makes that a rule for everybody can tell me what they even mean when they say it. <laughs> Number one, what does full range mean? Well, you know, and as soon as they say, as far as your muscle can shorten and lengthen, it's like, well, you just looked at a power lifter who barely moved his arms at all, and that was full range for the sport. So you're wrong. Oh, and by the way, even if I go, if I straighten my elbow all the way out, is my, are my two joint muscles all the way lengthened? No. So really it's arbitrary. It's something we made up. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying we don't know what it is. We probably should stop recommending something when we don't actually know what we're talking about. I think range of motion should be specific to the individual and the goal and their current, their current ability to perform it with control. When we move, moment arms of resistance change. So things get either heavier or they get lighter. And our ability inside, moment arm and length tension changes. So we either get stronger or weaker. By arbitrarily saying, you should squat all the way down. And by the way, if you're built like a power lifter, all the way down means your calves are sitting on your hamstrings and you barely make it to what the rules say. Versus she might squat all the way down and be really, really, really much different mechanical position than the power lifter would be. Totally unrelated. So just be careful, please, with this range of motion idea. And above all, be careful with prescribing things, suggesting things, just because a magazine said so, just because someone we thought had our best interest in mind said so, because everything we tell someone to do has to be based upon what we've learned about them. There are five questions. Does anybody know the five questions I'm getting ready to ask? What are the five things we have to ask every time we're going to make an exercise decision for someone else? There are five questions. There is no such thing as a general way to do an exercise for an individual. If I find a reason to have you do a bench press, there is no reason in the world why I would make you do it like a power lifter unless you decide you're going to be a power lifter and then I would tell you, don't waste your time. Sorry. So the first thing I had to do is figure out who I'm talking to. And if I'm a power lifter, and I'm helping someone who's there to be healthy, feel better, get stronger, but his idea of getting stronger is to be able to play with his kids without his back hurting. Talk, who am I talking to and who am I talking about? Who am I recommending things to? And what is their goal? Because if their goal, if their world, if their everything is different than mine, I have no right to impose what I do or what I like upon this person who has nothing to do with me except they hired me. That should just be God's law of personal training. Don't you think? The five commandments. They're different than the others. These are just for personal training, okay? So who are we talking about? Who is in front of you? What is their goal? And even if their goal is something amazing, what do they need to do right now to even begin that process? They may not even be in the realm of... I have worked with a lot of people whose, job, whose goal it was to walk again and they couldn't move their toes in bed. There were a couple things to do before trying to walk. Can you imagine? It's the same thing. We just don't understand it. It's the same thing when someone comes in and says, I want to feel better. I want to look better. I want to, whatever it is that they're thinking is just general health and fitness and stuff. There's a, they may have walked in and handed you a lot of issues going on inside of them. To immediately choose an exercise because it looks like the end goal is a very, very amateur mistake.
In our industry, we seem to have forgotten this idea of you have to walk before you can run and you have to stand before you can walk and you have to be able to be alive before you can stand. I saw you trying to train dead guys the other day and it didn't work out very well. Muscular mechanics. How, you know this, but what are muscle mechanics? What are the mechanics of the musculature that I'm talking about here and how would that affect strength? This is back to that muscle torque idea. The tension that a muscle produces and what is its moment arm at any given point in the range, that thing we've been talking about, here's where it fits in. And different people, because of the way they're built, some people are gonna have much larger moment arms at some point in the range than what you might or I might. But one thing that's consistent is where my moment arm is the biggest for this, this tissue in this joint, so is yours, and so is yours, and so is yours, because it's about where the muscles are attached. Does that make sense? So there, while the actual number may be different from person to person, probably is, the general trend of where you're weaker and stronger as an individual, as a human, those are fairly consistent. Here's a big topic, and we've only touched on a little bit of it, the resistance mechanics. We need to know, we need to understand the variables that are created by the weight. You under, we talked about inertia. If someone is throwing it, what we're gonna call later kind of launching it, does that make sense? If I launch something, I swing it, throw it, it may be a lot of weight that I wasn't actually responsible for once I started throwing it. So how much someone can move in what way and what are the physics of that load? And because that's what we're trying to use to measure this. I go to conferences in the United States all the time. And one of the first things I started asking, everybody there is certified and they're all quite proud of it. And they're all pretty sure that they could, you know, like split the atom tomorrow with their personal training certification. Okay. But they can't tell me why a weight is heavier here than it is here. In fact, I'm really sure these people don't work out because they look at me like, it is? I didn't know. It's like, what have you been doing? Oh, you've been swinging stuff the whole time. You didn't even know that there was a place that's heavier and lighter because you're just throwing it like a baseball every time you turn around. We have to understand, where'd it go? We have to understand the physics of the resistance, and that all of these things are a long process. All of these things change or influence whether we appear strong or not. Just like if I was choosing a leg press, remember the leg presses we looked at on the angles? If I wanted to look really strong, I would choose one that I saw one time, it was 30 degree angles. I showed you the 30 degree angle, the very low one, because if I put 500, if I can leg press 500 pounds, I can put a thousand on there. So, what, so that's the only one I want to buy. I want to sell all the others. I just want this one. I'll put it in my bedroom and, you know, all night long I'm pushing on the leg press. If I say the word support relative to exercise, what pops up into your head? I'm not talking about a weight belt. That's not what I mean by support. What do you think? Talking about what's un... Uh, what's supporting me right now? Ah, I'm glad it's there. It's very supportive. What if the floor wobbled? Would that change how much I could lift? That, see what I mean? So anything you're on, if I'm standing on this, if I'm, if I'm on something solid, it changes the number I can lift. If I'm standing on something that moves, it's, it changes what my brain allows me to do in terms of how much I can lift. I have no foundation, in other words. Does that make sense? So that's what I mean by support. It was the idea of the ball versus the guys that were just squatting on the ground. So we've already recognized that that's a variable, but you also, you brought up machines. The guidance, this machine, that machine, they all have a path of motion that's predetermined, right? That will 
almost always allow you to appear stronger. It will allow you to just push or just pull without having to learn a skill like moving dumbbells might. Do you follow me? So here's an important question. A question we should learn to think about before we ask, eventually. Is a dumbbell press... That's a trick question. Is a dumbbell press a good strengthening exercise? I already told you two questions to ask in the five commandments of personal training. Good strength exercise for who? Well, for anybody. Nope. It is absolutely not a good one for anybody. Does anybody in here? Everybody here has perfect clients, right? Perfect posture. They look like robots, terminators, right? All this. They can do everything. They're, nobody's like this. None of your clients are like this, right? Uh, and all of your clients are 18 to 20 years old, right? All of them. So you can like shoot them in the head in the army and they're like, like that. They're indestructible, right? So give me the people that I work with that I enjoy working with the most because what we do actually matters to their life. And this person is like this because he's 99 years old. And he's way better than most of my 20 year olds, quite frankly. But if I lay him on a bench with dumbbells, he's going to spend more struggle trying to control the dumbbells and trying to be comfortable on the bench. This is never going to be a strengthening exercise for him ever. Now, if you think I just said, dumbbell presses suck. Can she translate that? She's thinking about it. She's thinking about it. Did she do it? Marianne, did it work? No? Come on. It's going to be fun. Okay, just checking. I can't do that. That's not what I said. Who are we talking about? If, if he's been doing dumbbell presses for years and his skill level is so perfect that he looks like a machine himself, like a robot, it's a strengthening exercise for him potentially. But that doesn't mean it is for everybody. That is something we have to change, is this idea that if it's good for us or we like it, that it's good for everybody, and that's just not the way it is. Who are we talking about? What is their goal? And then what I just showed you about this man I used for an example, how much, how many positions did he have for his spine? What range of available joint positions did he have? To even, could he even get his shoulder blades on the bench? Could he extend his thoracic spine and get his rib cage up? Because that's absolutely vital for a chest exercise. It's a necessary requirement. If he can't do those things, then he doesn't have what's required for that activity. I've got to build an activity around what he has available. So the first question was, who are we talking about? And the second question was, what is the goal? And not just their big goal, but what's the goal of this exercise? What, what needs am I trying to take care of? And then what do they have available to do this? Because if they have a weakness here or a loss of available motion over here, I have to deal with that. I cannot just randomly choose an exercise from Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding and say, Arnold says it's good. All right, Arnold's an idiot. I'm sorry. He doesn't know anything about the person you have in front of you. He doesn't know anything. And by the way, he doesn't even care. So I'm just kind of picking on him for no reason. But he doesn't have any idea what we're trying to do. That book has no idea. The online things about exercise, social media has no idea about your client. Don't even ask them. Don't even watch. You're rotting your brain on social media. I'm telling you right now. It's cancerous for your brain. You believe me? Nobody believes me. Okay. So, if they have this motion available, can they own it? This sounds weird to say, can they own their motion? Do you know what I mean though? Can they actually perform the thing you're asking of them 
with enough control that you can actually add a little more challenge to it, what we call weight. And it just doesn't go all over the place. I know you've taught people dumbbell presses before. And it looks like this. So add more weight, right? No. That wasn't even a dumbbell press. They don't even own their arms. They're not even in charge of their arms. I don't know who's in charge of their arms, but they're sure not yet, right? And then the big question is, can they tolerate this thing? The positions of it? Well, plyometrics are important. For, <laughs> for who? For what, ge what general fitness goal was improved by plyometrics? I mean, it helps the people that sell the stupid things, right? But we don't run around in the medical world giving people injections just because somebody b s sells syringes, okay? We don't just have surgery because somebody made a table and a little scalpel. They're not good for everybody. Very specific places for very specific things. The more generalized your program is, the more unethical it is, the less targeted it is, the less progressive it is, and you can't call it personal training. I don't think. So, those things. Have you ever seen a row machine? Oh, funny we have a row machine right here. This one has the chest pad, right? That you could use or not use. Would you be stronger if you used it? Probably. Because you are not having to put so much effort into controlling this against the load, like if it was a cable row. But I also have to know what the goal is. Now you can cheat on that thing, not use that and swing the whole thing, but now we're back to the how many joints did you use that we weren't trying to use. So there's all of these things start fitting together. We've got to go back to the specificity it's all about specific scenarios and what do we want. And if we don't know what we want, it's hard to come up with a correct answer for what the person needs today, which is likely to change tomorrow. This is one of my favorite ones. Intention. And over the years, it's come to mean more and more, um, many different things to me. But for this purpose, we could say that the intention that affects your strength is what are you trying to do with that weight? What are you trying to, how are you trying to move? How abruptly, how strictly, all these things we talked about kind of come down to intention. How focused are you? You know as well as I do, if I had, let's, let's say he can squat 500 pounds and he's done it before, one time he can do it, one rep max. You with me? And we put him up here and he has to focus normally when he does that. But today, I have a new rule for you, and we're going to do algebra at the same time. Okay? So you're going to, let's just start with counting. Forget the algebra for a second. We're going to count backwards from, from 100 by sevens. Okay? While you're squatting the 500 pounds. Do you think he would be weaker or stronger than when he's focused? Probably weaker. So by taking your attention and intention away from something we know you can do you've done it before i've i've you know I've, I've asked you to multitask everybody's heard this term before multitasking is a great way for people who aren't focused to feel like they accomplished something that's not really a joke but some people think it is any specific endeavor is going to be better if you can focus on it if you have the opportunity it's not always possible but that's going to be an important piece of this puzzle. So when we're sitting there saying this person's not very strong or they were, gosh, they're not strong today. Did they just get, you know, like, did the cat die last night? Because they may not be very focused. Does that make sense? So there's a, lo a lot of things that can affect that stuff. This term, I mentioned earlier skill and I mentioned motor learning. Do you remember talking about that earlier? 
That's really where this comes in, orchestration. Orchestration, as the name probably makes you think, um, like a, a symphony, like an orchestra full of musicians. And local orchestration versus gross orchestration is such a huge piece of this puzzle. For example, the local orchestration, when you're doing, let's, let's use the squat idea again, okay? When you start preparing, you know what the world calls warming up? I hate the term warming up because heat has nothing to do with it. It is first and foremost about neurological preparation. It is about this. And what happens around each and every joint, specific to the muscles that are being challenged, your brain in the beginning says, this is why you're warming up. This is the lighter weights. You're doing some, it, the first thing it does if you put an EMG on there, and by the way, EMG cannot tell you anything about how hard something's working. It doesn't measure, measure tension. It doesn't measure force. It measures how hard your brain is trying to get something to work. It may not be working at all, but all it means is your brain is sending a signal and it's trying, okay? In the beginning, when you st start warming up with a squat, if we had EMGs all over you, there would be a lot of activity from the muscles until the brain said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's not using that much. We don't need all you guys right now. So some of you guys calm down, just relax. So it went crazy and then it came down a little bit. And here you are warming up. You with me? And that kind of happens all the way around the joint. So you get co-contraction, you've heard of that term before. And the brain's figuring out, here's who we need and here we're all fine tuning, you know, the signal and everything. And then if you go up in weight or if you fatigue, you start fatiguing, your brain goes, wait, we need more. So it throws too much at it again and it goes, all right, we did it again. That's a little too much. So let's calm down a little bit. So it does this thing when you're fatiguing, bringing in more and then it calms down. That's happening all the time until you actually finally, finally, final fatigue, it throws everything at it and you can't do it. That's called done. But at the same time, while all of that's happening around every joint, you see, that's really like if she's a violinist in this orchestra, she has to be good at her job. She has to be flawless at her job. And then in the beginning, as the conductor, I might say, I want a whole bunch of you guys. No, no, wait, wait, wait. This, this music works fine with just her and you guys just kind of relax for a second. We'll call on you later. So a little too much. And if she can't do her job, then what has to happen? I'm going to need some help or however many. So these decisions and orchestration are being made all the time. All the time. Every fiber is getting a signal. Every fiber that's participating. That doesn't mean they can all be chosen separately. But if a fiber's working, it's getting a phone call, okay? <clears throat> the big picture is to make this squat look like a squat or going over a hurdle look like going over a hurdle is the same thing as making a piece of music sound perfect. It is about all of you doing your job as well as she has to do hers. And sometimes this music requires you to not play at all. And sometimes you have to play much louder for a second and then back down. Everything you hear that makes that music what it is, is from changes in volume and changes in time and, cha and some people not playing and then some people, uh, you follow me? That is the building of us doing stuff. And your brain is the orchestra leader and it's happening every one th hundredth to one thousandth of a second. Did she get the hundredth of a thousand? Okay, just check. I was trying to be very specific. Do you think this could change whether you appear strong or not? How good your brain is at orchestrating this thing. How good, it's like the dumbbell press. We said if you get really good at the dumbbell press, it's, you, you will look stronger and it becomes a strengthening exercise because your skill level is high enough that the only challenge is the weight, not staying on the bench. It's not the challenge of, can I get my shoulder blades in position? It's not the challenge of, do I have, you follow me? All the pieces have to be there. And the skill level is then one of the biggest parts of strength. 
This is why, I'm getting ready to say something important. I raised my voice. Okay. Did you say it like that? Did you, did you say, this is why? Okay, see, this is why giving someone a one rep max on the first day is unethical. In the U.S., 12-year-olds walk in to play football two weeks before school starts, and they say, hey, let's see how much you can bench press. Have you ever bench pressed before? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have no skill level for this. You know why it doesn't matter? Because we don't know what we're doing. Because it does matter. This person is not showing you how much, how strong they are in a bench press. They're showing you how unskilled they are. And the more unskilled they are, the better chance of them getting hurt. This is, well, but I have to know what their one rep max is so I can take 80% of that so I can figure out what to do for five reps. No, you could actually just do five reps. I mean, that would be kind of a smart thing to do. Or you could teach. We don't give algebra tests before we teach counting. There are a lot of things in life where a pretest to have something to compare to is unethical, like war. Things that require learning must start with a virtual zero and find out how well they can do it, how well they're learning the skill. Does this look like they own their body? Or do you find out really fast they never should have been here in the first place? Because I'm not going to test their strengths. Because these kids are my responsibility. And this is one reason, at least in the U.S., the people that come from a background where we're taught to do that, which is a lot of us, have no idea how to deal with real people. Real people that have never done anything physical. Real people that need us more than anybody else. But they have no business jumping and they have no business doing one rep anything. Because that will not ever improve their ability to work with their kids, live their life, do all the stuff they have to do with their job. We've got to stop thinking like exercise people and start thinking like real people that understand the body and physics. Because that's what exercise really is. So all of these things will affect strength. Tolerance is an interesting one. Have you ever worked with people that they could do five pounds like this, they were so bored, they could do five pounds like all day long? And they could just talk and stuff. And if you went up one pound, they'd be like, oh my God, it's so heavy. And they're still doing like a thousand of them. It's like, how is that heavy? You have this person? You know those people? They have no, there's something about even adding the little, this tiniest bit of weight. They are mentally intolerant of it. They're emotionally intolerant of it. And I got to tell you, over the years, I've gotten to where I don't push them. Because in our little world with attorneys, if I push them and, they, and something happens and they go, I told you that was too much. I could argue all day long that they, it was only one more pound, judge. There's no way that was too much. Then explain the ruptured tendon. Well, I'm kind of at a loss for that one right now, but while I'm in jail, I'll think about that. I'm not going to jail. I have friends in Brazil I could go stay with. I don't have to go to jail. <laughs> you got a spare bedroom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just might need it someday. I don't know. Okay. Everybody okay? Stand up, breathe. Huh? No? You guys like sitting too much. I don't know. No? No break? Wow. You guys are tough. All right. Versions of strength. There's only three. There's lots of versions of strength. You've learned things about absolute strength and there's all kinds of names and all kinds of descriptions and keep those because they're different and they're good for maybe whatever you're doing. These are just different ways of thinking about it. And these have a little more to do with the scenarios we're talking about. And the scenarios 
are going to be physics specific. So I, there's, there's something I'm going to call launching strength. I mentioned that word launching before. You know what I mean by that? Where you're propelling something and you're not even worried about hanging on to it hardly. In the gym, if you were trying to actually control things, it would be called cheating. You remember when I said, you remember when I said, if this is what we want and this is what you got, this guy is in this mode. That is a version of strength. The more you can throw around, the more skilled you get at throwing it around, that can be very valuable. That is sports. That's jogging. Walking is much harder than jogging. If I have you walk as fast as you can walk, and by walking I mean there's always one foot on the ground, and you're walking as fast as you can, your tibialis anterior starts burning in like 20 seconds, and you're, you are dying to start jogging. Jogging is when sometimes there's no feet on the ground. You have launched yourself and then you catch yourself and then you launch yourself and you are doing this with inertia and muscle as opposed to just muscle. You cannot walk. You go, I can walk fast for 20 minutes. No, because if you're doing it 20 minutes, you're not walking as fast as I'm telling you to walk. Walk so fast you can't do it for a minute. That's fast. But you can jog all day, some people. You can jog for an hour, you can jog for 20 minutes. That means it's less work. Now, did I say don't jog? I didn't say that, I'm just saying, getting you to understand that jogging is like cheating when it comes to walking because it's easier. If you're really trying to get there fast. Now, what's the equivalent? If you're gonna start jogging, what would be the equivalent of the walking? Sprinting. You can't do that for 20 minutes. You are propelling yourself through the entire thing. There is no throwing and catching and throwing and catching. Do you see the difference between sprinting and jogging? Because sprinting when you're walking and sprinting when you're running, you can't do either one of them for more than just a few seconds at a time. And everything else is just throw it and catch it and throw it and catch it and throw it and catch it. And that's fine, but they do not serve the same purposes. Have you ever gone to the gym and sit on something? This is not even about a specific exercise. We could take a, this. Let's, let's pretend, pretend this is a leg extension. Everybody's seen a leg extension, and you know, whether you like them or not, it's irrelevant. But consider this idea that if we sit you on the leg extension and we do not tell you any rules for doing this, I just want you to move as much weight as you can move. You've watched people do that in the gym. And they just about, well, they do. They come out of the chair. They're, they're, they're rocking around all over the place. Do you know what I'm talking about? That is this. If I make this person stay in the seat, if I do not let him throw it, they can't do anywhere near the same weight because it's actually hard. They are actually now responsible for the entire load the whole time. And that is a whole different world. Both serve a purpose but they are not interchangeable. So there's two things. Number one, you need to know they're not interchangeable. And number two, you need to know something else I can't remember. You're paying attention. I was just checking. That way of doing it in a very strict manner is really important to understand. Because that's actually asking to, for you to um, come up with every fraction of every second to come up with your muscular ability. You're not just throwing it and watching it fly away or catching it on its way back down. There's so many horrendous things you see people do in the gym. This is exactly why we can never say, is that exercise a good or bad exercise? You show me 100 people doing it, and I'll show you probably 99.5 of them are doing a pretty bad job, which makes it a pretty bad exercise. 
But that's not the exercise's fault, is it? I've gotten to where I just about refuse to answer that question. Is that a good exercise? I don't even know what to do with that. How are you performing it? What was the goal? Who are you talking about? What do they have? What are they? It's one thing we might try to do is not default to an asking questions without trying to consider answers ourselves based upon what we paid to learn. Before we ever ask another question that could be a really good question, sit back and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, before I, before I give the responsibility of an answer to someone else, maybe I've learned something since yesterday where I can, maybe I can come up with an answer or two of my own and then, then they can help me see if I was on track or not. That's, that's, that's being a student. Do you follow me? Not necessarily guessing, but going, is there any, what do I see in this now? What do I see now that I have experiences that I didn't have yesterday? What do I see now that I listen to this idiot from Oklahoma for all, like two hours? I hopefully got something out of that, right? It would be so great. Anyway, she didn't say it as good as I did. <laughs> all right, bias muscular strength. What does that mean? That's the stuff you already do and you do it with control, only there's no inertia. When you squat, you know it's heavier at the bottom, it's lighter at the top. I showed you why, strength resistance relationship. You're getting the benefits of exercise built around gravity are not the same top to bottom. It is biased, harder in one point in the range than in the other. If you're controlling it, not throwing it, you are absolutely getting stronger. You're improving your muscular output or capacity for producing tension, but you're doing it in and around the profile that the resistance offered which doesn't mean it's consistent with human strength. It's just what you did. And that's fine. We've been doing it for a long time and it's served a lot of people well. What's next? Unbiased muscular strength. What this means is I'm gonna to try to build an exercise. If this is the goal, I'm trying to build an exercise that is exactly consistent with the way a human is built, where they are, generally weaker and where they're generally stronger because it is absolutely there is no point to worrying about full range of motion if we're not worried about a full range challenge <laughs> moving this far and only having this much of it actually challenged what's the rest of this for in an exercise you follow me so if i want Un, what am I, unbiased? Yes, it's not biased towards gravity. It's not biased towards any other goal than making this machine a better machine. So all the rules are built around zero inertia. There's no throwing it. Understanding resistance profiles that hopefully come close to matching the strength profiles we're getting ready to talk about. So now I've got to understand how to manipulate resistance. All of these things, if they sound foreign, these terms of themselves, they don't have to. You have a choice. When I keep throwing out these terms, it's like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I don't want to listen anymore. Or you can go, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to find out. I don't know what that is, and I'm going to find that out too. And then I'm going to figure out how to make it work for, for the lady I work with at 10 o'clock on Tuesdays. <clears throat> so what are examples of this launching, cheating, strength thing? Have you ever seen, you've seen Olympic lifting, right? It doesn't look like they're moving very fast, but listen, they could not pick up that whatever, 600 pounds and move it slowly. Right? So it is this incredible skill of exploding under this thing. And in essence, you're launching it and you're living off of the inertial effects here. That's the skill. Have you ever seen, you've seen gymnastics, you've seen when someone gets on the rings or a bar and they kip up on to position, that's inertia. That's launching it. In the gym, if that was supposed to be an exercise, that would be cheating because you made it easy instead of hard. So it serves a purpose here. But I want you to get a picture. I know, by the way, if you're in CrossFit and they do kipping pull-ups, I don't know what we're trying to accomplish except I'm going to leave it at that. <clears throat> it 
Here's another thing where cheating can be important. I've got, remember my 99-year-old guy you thought I was just telling you a joke? My 99-year-old guy, we spent years trying to get him. He couldn't get out of a chair. He'd broken his hip. Now he can get in and out of a chair. But along the way, he didn't have the strength to get all the way to a chair. And he had to use some inertia to cheat up out of it. Does that make sense? And he's gotten so strong that he doesn't need much anymore and so skilled that it's like you, if you blink, you miss it. Here's a couple examples. He's really strong at going down. Oh, let's let him plop down. I let it make him work and work and work on control. 99 years old this week. Now watch how good he is over here. Watch, watch, watch. Woo! Did you see that little arm thing? You're like, he didn't do anything. I'm going, I know. It's great. He could kick all your 99-year-old clients' asses. Do you have any 99-year-old clients, by the way? They're so great. He's got a good sense of humor, too. So. All right. We talked about jogging, that kind of stuff. And every time anybody ever did an improperly performed exercise in the gym that was counter to their goal, they're pretty much wasting their time. And it's this version of strength they're taking advantage of. They want bigger numbers and less results, in essence. <clears throat> Biased muscular strength. That's the controlled stuff we've been doing forever. Bench presses and rows and squats and all that kind of stuff. But not necessarily on a machine that alters the profiles. So it'd be more like your cable row and your dumbbell row and your bench press and your barbell, all that free weight stuff would be very similar to this. There's also an interesting example. This is the other version of gymnastics and I, I, I always forget to look for a video for this. Have you ever seen um, a male gymnast pull himself up to the rings and do what they call a muscle up? Have you ever seen that? It make, it's so cool, it makes you want to just throw up. It's awesome. It's just the best. So they grab up here, and they do a, they're doing like a chimp. And they get all just like this. And you're going, there's no way. He's just like this, and you're like going, it wasn't even difficult for that guy. What's, he's a freak. He's an alien. It's awesome. But there's no inertia. There's no cheat. You see what I mean? It was 100%. You either got it or you don't. It's pretty amazing. That's this version of strength. Can he get up out of the chair without using any arms? That would be our end goal for that. That'd be this type of strength. So these all become versions of exercises or assessments or both. Because to me, having pre-planned assessments that are not directly related to what I'm going to do, they're worthless. I am absolutely not remotely interested in what someone's hamstring flexibility is in terms of just touching their toes because they can bend their knee to tie their shoes. There's absolutely no reason to do that. It's not indicative of having low back pain. It's just something we do for no reason. When what I really want to assess is what they are getting ready to do for an exercise. And can they do more? Do they need to back off? I'm assessing. There's no such thing as an assessment before and assessment after. Assessments happen every fraction of every repetition that they're performing. We don't have time to blink. So this, out, this unbiased thing, what is this? Well, this is where it gets a little tougher. We're certainly eliminating inertia, but we're also trying to get the points in the range where they're weaker to have less challenge, the points in the range where they're stronger. We're going to try to have more. They're typically single joint activities, although spinal movements fall into the same thing because the muscles that we're dealing with span multiple joints. This inertia thing is the key holding everything else that's not moving, intensely static is the skill that most people cannot do. This is not a substitute for anything else we've talked about. All of these things are very, very valuable. We just have to find out when and for who. So, now we're not doing that exercise, by the way. We're going to talk about strength profiles, though. <clears throat> okay, the first profiles we're going to look at are single joint movements. Where are we strong and where are we weak? And remember that what makes us weak or makes us strong 
is torque, muscular torque. Where our moment arms and our length tensions, what are they creating in terms of output for us? You cannot, by the way, you cannot use anything in a gym to test this version of strength because everything you use in a gym will have a moment arm change occurring while you're doing it. So the number that you're thinking is show, showing their strength isn't because you're not comparing, you're not measuring torque. So I've had to do a lot of work and ongoing and I mess it up all the time and I realize I mess up stuff all the time to get closer and closer to these answers. So hopefully they're far enough down the road here that we're not gonna be <laughs> too, too far off by the time we figure out something tomorrow. Um, but from the long end to the short end, some of our single joint resisted activities have kind of a dome-shaped curve. Some, but not all. Typically, these that I'm going to put in the first category, I'm going to call A. These are joints that have a large, what the world would call range of motion. What I'm going to say is a large range of available joint positions. Like what would happen here. That's a lot of motion available or positions available. Does that make sense? And at the same time, this is where you really have to almost sit down and look, know the anatomy well enough to be able to envision what's going on. But the moment arm changes that are occurring from here to here in elbow flexors, there's a huge range from small to maximum to small again, depending upon how much your elbow can bend. Does that make sense? So if, give me this. She can bend to there. If I can't bend that far, then we're gonna have a slight difference in how much it drops off at the short end. If her arm was this big and she can only bend to here, that's gonna change the outcome of this thing. So it is all range dependent because that changes the moment arms of her muscles. So those are among the two most important factors. There will of course be a length tension issue. And the length tension issue in this specific set of strength profiles is mostly determined by two joint muscles. So your elbow flexors, you've got actually three two joint muscles, if you include the brachioradialis, and your brachialis is the sole single joint. That is a fairly typical trait of muscles, not always, because anatomical pulleys and that kind of thing start getting in the, throwing their mechanical uh, influence in. But it's gonna be predominant. Um, so you're looking at elbow flexors. Knee flexors have start to get, be one of the things that kind of change because how much someone can bend their knee changes dramatically among people. If nothing else, due to the size of their tissue, fat, muscle, whatever. You can have some people who can bend their leg and, and then testing is another problem because I can't be seated on something that gets in the way of the test. So there's a lot of nightmares in doing this. But that's one that I'm not confident it's gonna show up on the single joint profile B also because I'm like, eh, how far can you bend? You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Elbow extensors are questionable. It seems like because of the, you know, the name of this guy, Elecranon, that anatomical pulley, when, it, when you get to here, the tricep has no help from that. When you're here, you lose it pretty dramatically also, plus the length tension at the short end gets really, really weak. So it seems, elbow extensors seem to fall into this category. Your pectoralis major, your latissimus dorsi, they are changing in moment arm dramatically as you move a joint that also goes through a tremendous range. So that was the one that looked like a dome. Most, most of the single joints, single joint muscles, single joint profiles, sorry. So most of the single joint profiles are this next one. <clears throat> oh wait, I'm getting way ahead of myself. 
Can you rewind the translator over there? So the, the two joint muscles. I need to show you the influence of those. And I was, we were talking about it, but here's a couple of pictures that might help. You remember I was talking about the bicep <clears throat> and yeah, this brachialis doesn't change, but this guy comes up here and does something different. So when this elbow bends, that two joint muscle goes through a certain shortening and lengthening excursion in that picture based solely upon how much the elbow could bend. If we start back there, it starts at a longer position, but when you bend your elbow the same amount, it goes through the same excursion, it's just all longer. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. If I started up here, arm overhead, the whole thing is starting at a shorter length. So it gets really short because it started shorter. So those three different shoulder positions are required, not in necessarily one activity, but to see the full range of differences in strengths of the elbow flexors, for example. So <clears throat> here's um, the moment arm change that's really dramatic that I was talking about. So there's a moment arm right here, as you can envision. Did I actually put one in there? No, I didn't. So there's a moment arm right here. This moment arm got huge. Can you see the difference? That's just really small compared to this one right here, perpendicular distance. And then it gets really small again if we continue this line down here. That's a huge mechanical variation in ability. Why all the muscles getting shorter and longer with length tension? <clears throat> so if, if you were to look at these numbers, what you're going to see is that just bending the elbow from zero, which is straight, to about 140 degrees, I taped this little thing on there like a fake bicep, and it changed 10 centimeters from 23 to 33. So it was 33 here and 23 here, going through 140 degrees. <clears throat> if I put the arm behind in extension, see how it's back here now? It starts longer. Instead of starting at 33, it starts at about 35. Can you see that? But by moving the elbow 140 degrees, it goes through the same amount of change. So what you're gonna see over here goes from 35 to 25. So it's the same 10 centimeter excursion. It just started longer and did not end as short, which makes sense. So what do you think is gonna happen if we go overhead? So now here's the shoulder down here. Whoops, where is it? There's the shoulder, arms held overhead and we bend the elbow 140 degrees. This time it started at a much shorter length. It started at 30. Oh, sorry, it started at 20. I got on flip-flop. Started at 20 and went to 30. So each one of these starting positions was different. If you want to get as short as possible, you've got to start where it's going to end the shortest. If you want to do work from the longest possible position, you've got to start where it starts the longest. And if you want to see everything a bicep or slash elbow flexors can do, you would have to do them all. Go, go, go. Ah. So here's single joint A, but, but, this is just the mid ranges. If I only, if I choose this shoulder position or this shoulder position or this shoulder position, which by the way, in exercise traditionally, we would do a curl here or something up here, something in this shoulder position, turns out those are the same thing. The length change is so insignificant. But if I go to, come on, I think my battery's dying. Go and go. Huh? Did it go finally? Maybe I squished the batteries. Um, if we go up to shoulder flexion, you go to shoulder flexion, it's going to get what? It's going to get what? Shorter. So it falls off, it gets much shorter. Now it's just doing it by itself. So now it gets much shorter, but as you would suspect, you're stronger here where it's because you didn't go as long as you did before. You're way weaker at the end of the shortening because it got so much shorter. And if you started in a position as a shoulder extension, so you can see that while it's still that dome shaped curve, if I start back here, more extension falls off more. Deflection, I don't get as weak as if I do when I'm up here because it's not as short. So if you go back and think through those, oh, come on, man. 
We're never going to finish this if this thing doesn't. Huh? Okay. So the profile for single joint B. Do you want to check the batteries in this? Or do you want me to come over there and click it? There we go. Single joint B, what is that? They don't move anywhere near as far. The ranges of motion are not as great. The moment arm changes of the muscle are really small, almost non-existent. They never actually ever, ever, ever get to a quote unquote stretched position. These are predominantly single joint muscles. So let me show you some examples. Hip ab and adductors. Can you envision them? They will never get to a lengthened position where the length tension starts to fall off. Just think about it. Can you actually feel a stretch in an abductor of your hip? Try to stretch your deltoid right now. You ever stretch your deltoid? Can't do it. The only thing you ever feel a stretch in is two joint muscles. There's no such thing as stretching a single joint muscle. When someone says, oh, you need to warm up, you need to stretch your quads, what position do we get into to stretch our quads? Hip extension, right? And knee flexion, right? Which means you're really lengthening what? Rectus femoris, that's it. That's it. Your position you're in right now, I want you to bring your knee right up, bring your knee right up, grab one knee and tuck it into you like you're trying to stretch your other quadriceps. You feel them stretch? No. Single joint muscles never get long enough to have the extreme length tension change. It's not possible the joint stops before the, before the muscle does. So all of these abductors, your patella affects your quadriceps the same way. Plus they're mostly what? Single joint muscles. So take a look at these guys. Here's your abductors. You can go from adducted to abducted and the moment arm virtually doesn't change. Not like that bicep picture I showed you. And if I change to a different attachment point up there, just to see, it's the same idea as we go from adduction to abduction, the moment arms virtually don't change. And they sure didn't lengthen enough to get to a point where the length tension fell off, but they can get pretty darn short. So that's why you see the profile that starts strong where you're long and it gets weak where you're short. <clears throat> and you can see this in exercises all over the place. The same thing with this guy where you can see the moment arms don't really change in that. And the trunk is the exact same way as this single joint B. When you're long, you're strong. And when you're short, you're weak for the same reasons. Let's go through extensors. They're lying against your spine. And I don't care if you're flexed or extended, they're still lying against the spine. The moment arms of those muscles do not change. They go from long to short. And you're never going to bend far enough forward to feel stretch in those guys. Your abs are interesting because the moment arm does appear to change. Of course, in order to have that, you would have to have no intestines in order to have a moment arm that small. So as long as you have intestines, that's probably not accurate. But even though the moment arm gets better, this muscle gets so short that it can't do much at that full, fully shortened position or that fully flexed position. The most dramatic profile of all this stuff is in trunk rotation. And there are no moment arm changes. If you can envision through the center of the body where I'm rotating, your muscles are not moving in closer to the axis. They're the same moment arm the whole time. The difference is the angle. When she's starting out left rotated, these external obliques are much more in the plane of rotation. And as she goes to neutral or fully right rotated, these guys cannot pull her any further into that. So the more extreme of length you start in, the stronger you're going to be for two reasons. The angle of the fibers, including something they never talk about, your rectus abdominis, if you start from a rotated position, becomes a rotator the other way. If you, go, if you start from over there, it rotates you back this way. From the middle, it can't rotate you either way. So when you go to an extreme of rotation, you have way more muscle 
mechanically pulling you out of that position makes you really strong. And by the time you get to the other end, the short end, mechanically you've got nothing and it's, it's so weak, it's ridiculous. Falls off like almost ten time, tenfold. So, um, I know you're excited. Do you like those little guys? Do you like the little kid? Which one do you like best? Huh? The left one? Are you biased? Okay. All right, we're almost finished. Are you going to live? You sure? No? Okay. But we'll try. Okay. These are a little more difficult to um, understand. Multiple joint, pressing, or we should say straightening your limb against resistance, which is like a squat or a leg press or a bench press or a dumbbell press, or bending your limb against resistance, which is typically just upper extremity pulling exercises. Those are really the two we're looking at. And these things don't exist as innate biomechanical things. The single joint things when we're moving, that is watching the torque change in you, of you, based on your anatomy. Doing a press is not an anatomical thing. Doing a pull is not an anatomical thing. So the only way to analyze these is to choose the way we would be doing it and analyze that. And that's not too difficult to do if you understand that there's very specific exercises we choose to measure strength. Deadlifts, squats, bench presses, that kind of stuff. And if we use those resistance profiles, the specific way those are loaded, you come up with something really interesting. If we change the way it's loaded, none of these apply anymore. You follow me? I'll show you what I mean. So this is going to be where you're starting with your arm or your leg bent and you're going to where your arm or your leg is straight. So any of those pressing or um, squatting or... Oh, sorry. You could have just scream at me and I could... I bet that kind of looked cool actually. <laughs> Special effects. <clears throat> So we're, we're pushing, basically, okay? And this is the weirdest one of all. It's just, it, because while you're in a bent position, your muscles are at the longest they're gonna get in this exercise. When you're at this position where your arm is straight and the weight is virtually balanced, you're also in a position where your muscles are the shortest they're gonna be in this exercise. This is an interesting dilemma. Because in the beginning on the first few reps, you're structurally sound here. But as you start to fatigue, you're going to fatigue more near the shortened end of contraction. And you might not make it back up to where you were so strong a minute ago. Does that make sense? If you've ever done it with control, you've seen it where someone you can tell when they're fatiguing along the way. And they might get stuck right here. This is almost the lightest place. Why are they stuck here? Because fatigue is overtaking the loss of moment arm of the resistance. You'll never know that if you're throwing the weight because you'll skip right past the good stuff. Power lifters live through that because they can't throw the weight. So they very often will get to what they call a sticking point when in fact it's just that fatigue overcame before resistance moment arm decreased fully. So what's happening here? Why is this so weak where we're bent well if that's where you stop because you have to because of how you're built because of your tissue your mass of muscle whatever it is it, or you just choose to stop here you're not going to go down to this this will be your line of strength at the starting position unless you go lower you can have your strength fall off much more if you end up down there. The people that can end up there getting out of that position is a nightmare. Assuming you're talking about your maximum ability to get out of here, you are so weak in this position in an attempt to get back up to this, which is where the dotted line was. And obviously from this point, it just gets lighter. 
The moment arm resistance is getting lighter the whole way up. Getting from here to, the, to bigger moment arms here, this position to this position is what that was about. And the same thing happens here. If I go lower, not only will I have the same unfolding problem, my mechanical ability at the joint is horrendous. If I go that low, I'm going to end up in this position down here. Some people will never get there. Some people will choose to stop before there. Some people, so it's about how low can you go or how low do you choose to go? Does that make sense? Why do we get so incredibly strong right here? Because that's that loss of resistance moment arm. That's that strength resistance relationship thing. So <clears throat> what those guys look like is what you saw here. Those have almost no moment arms. So they really appear to be strong here. They've got to get that straight though before they look that strong. What happens over here? This doesn't follow our rules. These were analysis of specific pressing exercises, not just anything where your arm straightened. Remember I said that? The way it's loaded is everything. It's scenario specific. So if I have a cable pulling to the outside and it looks like a press, it doesn't qualify. That basically starts to look more like a single joint profile. It is the folding and unfolding relative to that line of resistance that makes these profiles what they are. And that's the way it works in most strength training um, exercises. This is not a cable pulling out, but the machine actually angles outward. And as here's a cable pulling out, none of these profiles or exercises will match the profile we just looked at. It is that specific. So we can't even say, oh, it's just all pressing or all squatting or whatever. We can't do that. It is about how the load falls through the body. So the thing I haven't shown you on a graph here, but I did tell you before we started looking at the graph was that this is the weirdest one because, let me go back to the little curve. Where you, during testing, would be the strongest. How much weight you could hold balanced over you versus how much weight you could hold down here. If we go ahead and get you completely fatigued doing that exercise, as I mentioned, and you're not going to be able to get all of a sudden that strongest place, you're going to fail. That thing is going to completely flip-flop if you do it with control. And it's going to that strong end because fatigue, if it takes over before you finish the rep, that's going to be your weakest end. And it's a really, really interesting thing to test. It's a nightmare to try to do because people want to cheat. Your brain is not interested in giving up. It wants to get there and just right there, just do something. And then the, the test is off. You can't test it. So here's pulling, a pulling exercise, cable row, dumbbell row, whatever. So we're starting here with your arms straight. Why are you so strong here with your arms straight? Why are you so weak down here for some reason? Well, same idea. If the cable's pulling that direction, then there is virtually no, there's no moment arms to your joints, right? So there's no torque of resistance. So unless your grip gives way, you can sit here all day long. Another feature that's valuable here in terms of the strength in this area is your rib cage is acting like an anatomical pulley. So your lats and friends actually wrap around it and pull straight backwards. By the time you actually go through the range of motion, it's going to end up creating a scenario where you get incredibly weak. So back here at this end, if you can get back this far, the moment arms at each joint increased and your lat is not pulling the direction you're trying to move anymore. So resistance is against you, it went up, your strength left you mechanically and physiologically. So when you do this thing, everything changes dramatically. That's why the curve looks the way it does. Go back and look at that one more time. And it's the exact same, if you will, from the pressing one in that, why were you so strong here in a press? Because the weight was balanced through you. Why are you so strong here when something's pulling? Because the weight's balanced through you. And it's when you get back here that for different reasons, you have a different amount of drop-off in ability, with this being by far the most dramatic loss of ability 
of any upper extremity thing. Well, this is a big deal because if we're doing dumbbell rows, cable rows and that kind of thing, while people have been successful at them forever, they demand cheating, they demand it. If you actually have enough weight on a cable row, for example, to challenge you up here, you're never gonna finish this. That's why we do that. And we get really good at it, right? And it was like, that's how you do a cable row. Like, that's how you cheat because you got a shitty cable row. So did she translate that? This is the problem with those things. This, above all other exercises, above all other exercises, pulling exercises really, 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 really need dramatic resistance profile strategies if we're actually going to work through the full range of motion. Not just perform the full range of motion, but actually have a full range challenge because you can easily do twice as much from here to here as you can do back here. If the profile doesn't offer you that, then you're either got a, you got a bunch of weight here and nothing back here because you had to cheat or you've got a weight that's light enough you can do it back here and it's nothing up here. And like I said, people have survived and achieved goals with that being the standard, but that doesn't mean that once we know some of these things, we have to keep the same old standard. If it's all we've got, we'll make the best of it. Maybe we do two different portions with two different weights. Maybe lighter back here and heavier up here. Maybe not. I'm just saying that the more we understand this kind of stuff, we can change dramatically the efficiency with which we challenge somebody and help to get them stronger. And that's where these machines and eventually understanding how the resistance from the machine changes, keeping in mind that it still is about the moment arm to your joints along the way. But this machine has a really, has two different cams and a bunch of other things going on, linkage system that makes it fall off well, by the time you, from start to finish, it, it oh, more than doubles in the amount of resistance during a press. That is pretty rare. Um, and if we do this machine like this, pulling them wide, we need to learn that, that by angling those things this way, we've actually made it heavier instead of just pulling straight back, which would have been whatever the machine did in engineering. But as soon as we start diverging our pull, we start increasing the resistance again. So all these little pieces of physics we're so many times doing a good job of controlling it, but we may be undermining ourselves with the resistance we create, even though it's what we've always done forever. Maybe we should rethink some of it. Anyway, here we are now. We're confusing, and look at all these directions we have to go. I don't know where to go. What do I do? I'll do this. How about that? But I feel like if we don't enjoy this industry enough and, and all the things that we can learn inside of it. And if it's not really our passion, then we'll always kind of be falsely empowered. We're gonna think we know some stuff because we know what they did 100 years ago. And I just don't think that's making us what we can be. And if we really think about it, if we take our time, if we progress ourselves and our education and don't get flipped out the same way we don't want clients to say, I wanna lose 20 pounds by tomorrow. It's gonna take some time. Same thing with our education, right? Taking the time to look piece by piece through everything. It's one of my favorite ideas was back when they started sailing around the world and all that stuff. I think this was actually an album cover, right? From something, Does anybody know? Somebody gave me the picture. But before they knew what was over there, they had to make up, we've never been there, but over the horizon, there's gotta be some scary stuff, right? You're gonna fall over the edge. There's monsters. Look, that guy up there is carrying that boat away. It's all kinds of scary stuff because we don't know what's there. For the most part, if we take a look at what we think we know, so much of it is just built upon the way it always has been. I love this quote. It is historical continuity that maintains most assumptions, not repeated assessment of their validity. And sometimes... This is true. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at actually change. 